It is a privilege and an honor to be together once again to enjoy the life that we do have. And it's um, so good to know that we are in the place that God wants us to be. When you're in that place of knowing where you belong, there's, a, there's an assurance, there's a confidence that you operate with. If you question something, if there's always this sort of a badgering doubt about something, then it's, it's difficult to function. It's hard to function. And that's what James says, that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And it's, it's indicative of the fact that you're questioning yourself. <laughs> and we don't want to be in that place. We want to always have this assurance. And one thing about God, He's always the same. He never changes. His Word says the same thing every time you open it. Has, have you ever read something different from what you read in your Bible? No. It says the same thing every single time. Other translations, transliterations, <laughs> but it says the same thing. And so God's Word can be depended on. And so with what we're discussing about this battleground of the mind and then we're talking about the weapons of our warfare, I want to encourage you with where you come from or where we come from. And that is, God has instilled in us His nature, and I thought I would subtitle this, The Nature of God is Our Measuring Stick. And for us to be able to see where we are, we have to have something that's the base to it. And there's always a, a foundation to what we do. A building, uh, any kind of project, there's got to be a foundation to it. And our foundation is God's nature. God, by nature, is love. And that being said, if God's nature is love, then whose nature do we have? God's nature, right? And I know that there's, a, there's a, this idea, and I've used my grandbaby quite often as a prop <laughs> with regards to the nature that we're born with. We're not born evil. You know, even though we may not be born again, but we're not born evil. We're born with, the, with everything that God is. And God is love. And so, by nature, we're born with a natural way of, of judgment and discernment. There's just something in us that says right or wrong, that lets us know what's the good. And really, technically, because there's a, there's a misconception out there that the only way good can be known is to measure it by evil. And that's a misnomer. That's a, that's a trans, transposed position. Evil is known because of how good is. God is good. God is not measured by Satan. Satan's measured by God. <laughs> so that being said, God is good. God is love. And when we go from that perspective, then we have a right judgment or discernment. So we, what we experience in life either enhances us or corrupts our judgment. So as the years go on, obviously, we're in an adverse environment. We are dealing with some, some evil spirits out there. I was going to say, I was going to personalize and make humans, you know, <laughs> evil. <laughs> but humans are not evil. But do they succumb to evil? Yep. Yes. Uh -huh. and, that, and that definitely does happen. And we're, they're more susceptible when, you don't, when they don't know Jesus. Right. And that's the first step. Foundationally, we need Jesus. In our lives and that's when this this recreated position takes place spiritually okay so but throughout the years you know we, our judgment is either going to be enhanced or it's going to be corrupted so this is why we need Jesus in our life spiritual condition the spiritual condition needs to be reborn or made alive again or born from above and that all of us here have experienced. If you haven't experienced it, you need Jesus in your life. And the only person that can fix your spiritual condition is the Lord, Jesus. The new birth is an empowerment to take control of our thinking. And that's, that's the thing. Jesus came to, to liberate us to think, not to be controlled. God wants us to use our minds. Now, he does have a standard to go from, and that is love. So if you, if you love, how are you going to treat? If, if you think about love as a fulfillment of the law, and we take the Ten Commandments, and we'll take that as a, as a premise, even though it's 
Genesis to Deuteronomy, where we take the Ten Commandments, though we find in Exodus chapter 20. And we just go from those simple things. The first five is about God, and the next five is about you and how you treat others. If you love, you fulfill the law. If I love my neighbor, I'm not going to think about having, uh, committing adultery with my neighbor's wife. Because I love my neighbor. Because that wouldn't be love. That's called lust. Because it's out of order. So anytime something is out of order, and when it comes to that side of things, that's called lust. Because it's not sanctioned by the Word of God. It's not ordained by God's Word. God knows the premise and the process of how we're to operate and what best way we are to operate in life. We don't need guilt, shame, and condemnation, which is a ploy of the devil to keep us under that jurisdiction of being governed by an outside force. We need to trust who God is with us, in us, and believe what He says. We got to learn this and process this. And we got to we start off with it, but then we have to relearn it. And you got to become born again in order for that power to be present in your life. Okay, so don't don't confuse psychology. Psychology is good, the study of the mind and understanding how you how the mind works, but that doesn't fix your spiritual condition. And the only thing that will fix your mental condition is becoming a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Period. Be a believer. Be a believer. Become another. <laughs> okay, James calls taking control of our thinking, saving the soul. And we think about the soul of man. We got, I got this uh, understanding about the affection of the soul. And I asked my wife, without her knowing the motive. It was more so just to think about this. And I asked her the question, and like you uh, husbands may, or if you were, if you got someone else in your life, if, if you ask your wife, why do you submit to me? Because that word, submit in the world today, is not a very uh, clean word for females. They don't like that word. Submit. Hey, listen. You su hey, you listen. You submit. <laughs> See, it's already a reaction. No, no. <laughs> she hasn't even got started yet. Okay. All right. All right. So that word. So I asked my wife, why do you submit to me? And her reply was, because you respect and love me. And consider. Respect and consider me. So here's the thing, the idea of submission is assumed that it is enforced. In some countries, the husband makes sure that you're going to submit as a wife because this is your job. This is, your, this is what's supposed to happen and we'll go to the Bible and we'll show it. Genesis chapter 3, just go right to the beginning. The woman's desire will be toward who? Is her husband. So the assumption is you're supposed to submit to me. When we read through the scripture and we come to the new covenant, uh, the understanding now is that we're joint heirs together. The same measure. Because in heaven, there's neither marrying or giving in marriage. There's not husband and wife in heaven. That's only here on earth. In a physical body. That's the only time that comes into play. You want to multiply, replenish from a physical standpoint, you got to have physical bodies. Okay? So that's only, only here on earth, the physical side of things. So with that being said, if, if the soul is to be treated as a wife, because husband with the wife, the reason for the wife submitting to the husband is because of how the husband loves the wife. And remember, Sarah called Abraham Lord, this is what you read in 1 Peter chapter 3, because of the way he loved her. And when you see this phrase, there's a phrase in there that says, likewise. And it starts off with, likewise, wives submit yourself to your own husbands. And anytime you see the word likewise, you need to find out why likewise is there. Because there was something that was written before that. 
And what you read in chapter 2 is how Jesus gave his life for us. And if Jesus gave his life, likewise you wives submit to your husbands. And then likewise you husbands love your wives. And treat them as the weaker vessel, not the weaker vessel. For any of us that are married, you all know that women, your wife is a strong person. Let's put it this way. Any of us men try to give birth to a, a 10 centimeter baby? Yeah. yeah. It's not gonna it's not gonna work. You're gonna have a hard time. <laughs> As a matter of fact, you may die. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> but God positioned the strength of the woman foundationally. You really think about that. Just metaphorically, the lower part of the female being the strength as it were, the foundation, as it were. Because for any good man, there's always a good woman attached to that good man. He that finds a wife finds a what? Good thing. So all these different things, you know, that come into play. When, and you think about the metaphors of it and how it speaks to us of that. Well, the same way we admire and desire our wife's submission to us, so likewise should we admire our souls in the same fashion. The soul is to be subject to us, not by force, but because you love it and you invest in it. You, you with me on this? I know I went on a long uh, illustration on that, but you, you get the point of this, right? Yeah. So this is where thinking, saving of the soul. James called it this, right? He says, this is James chapter 1, verse 16. He says, and this is very vital for you to pay attention to what is being said here. Okay, he says, do not, do not, let, uh, do not be led astray, my beloved brothers. I'm going to read the verses and then we'll, I'm going to touch on some things, okay? Do not be led astray, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom is no change or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Just gotta love baby girl. I love you, baby girl. <laughs> you know, there's a side note here. Anytime that there's a baby or an animal, it always they always take the yeah, the stage. <laughs> Definitely upstaged. <laughs> <laughs> okay, of his own will he brought us forth with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Therefore, my beloved brothers, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to, and slow to anger. Remember that from last week? For the anger of man does not work the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and remaining wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Now, verse 16 says, let astray, but let astray from what? Let us stray from what? And just a food for thought on this. Let away from God's original plan and purpose for who we are. And so there's so many ways that we can go. I mean, as, as the expression is, you know, to be inclusive with all walks of life. There is a way for us to function at the best. Now, you can go into the garage and start honking like a car and call yourself a car. You can get on all four knees and start barking like a dog and call yourself a dog. But it is not the best way for you to live. If you, you want to think yourself, you came from a monkey and you want to start walking like a monkey, go ahead. Let's see how well that plays out for you God never intended for us to be in that position y'all with me yes. so the led astray from what from what God originally intended for your life your purpose the plans right so verse 17 says every good gift every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above comes from the Father every good gift the greatest gift we have is the gift of life. This is the gift of life. Think about it. People want to live how long? Forever. 
<laughs> yes, forever. People don't want to die. Not normally. You got to really get to a bunch of disappointment, disappointments and discouragements and frustrations in life to say, I don't want to be here no more. But that's the rarity. It's not the norm. The norm is that you want to live. We want to live. And we want to live life. We want to live a good life. Right? So it's natural. Okay? And where did that come from? It came from God. God made us. And He made us how? Remember that. We read that in Genesis last week. Remember? We went through all the, the good. Everything was good. The light and the trees and the oceans and the birds and the creeping things. Everything was good. And when it came to man, he said it was what? Very, Very good. God made us how? Very. Very good. Now, sin altered this position. And we are well aware of that. But Jesus reinstated it for us. He reinstated our position. And that is spiritually. We don't have that mentally and we don't have it physically. That will come. The responsibility of how we think today is on us. Every good means of good, this is literally the, the Greek definition, of good constitution or nature, useful. What nature did we receive? Well, I mean, what nature do we have when we're born? We have God's nature. Whether you're born again or not, when you're born into the world, you have God's nature, the institution or the nature of God. It becomes corrupted because sin becomes alive in you when you know what's right and when you know what's wrong. Yeah. Romans chapter 7 says that I know what to do and I know the right thing, but I don't do it. And there's a reason for that. Because we're not trained that way. Now, we're not talking about works and salvation. Salvation in and of itself, you can never earn enough. The only way you can, you, can, you can save yourself is you have to die. But if you die, then where do you go? Well, you go to hell. <laughs> if you don't know Jesus. So Jesus came sinless, died for us sinless, and we received his righteousness. Amen. We're right standing with God because of Jesus. So you, you couldn't fix yourself. Jesus came and fixed us spiritually. But mentally and physically, we have a responsibility for that. But we have, see, look at, look at the phrase, this definition. Good constitution or nature, useful. Are, you, are we useful? Yes. If, you, if you are a good person, you are what? Useful. useful. Look at the question. What is a gift for? What's a gift for? A gift is meant to be what? It can't be a gift if you're the possessor of it. You own it. It's yours. And you keep it. It's not a gift. It can only be a gift when you what? Give it. You know, we went out. Well, I should say, let me reword that. My wife went out. And she got a gift for the birthday man today. So, what if I said, you know what, let me have it. <laughs> it's no longer a gift. It's mine. <laughs> so, you see the meaning? The meaning behind a gift and every good and perfect gift comes from above. Say, I'm a gift. I am a gift from above. But it is only active, say it, if I give it. You can't give like this unless you want to hit them. <laughs> right? You have to what? Open your hand. It cannot be called a gift unless it is given. Giving is the key to fulfillment in life. It's one of the means of being able to succeed in life. If we give. Luke 6.38 says, Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down. What, what does it say there? 
Give and what? Give and what? What do you got? You got to what? You have to give. It's a law. It is a law. Sowing and reaping. And Genesis 8.22 says, Seed time and harvest. How long does it remain? As long as the earth remains. How long is the earth going to remain? Do you guys know? Forever. Yes, yeah, not going to change. Remember, heaven is temporary. Yes. New Jerusalem's coming down where? Here. Right here on earth. Yeah. So how long will New Jerusalem be? Forever. Eternity. Yeah. <laughs> so seed time and harvest is how long? As long as the earth remains. Is what the Genesis 8.22 says. So how much time do we have to, to be able to give? All Eternity. Yeah. <laughs> Good measure. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Now, this is not, not to do with money. It's to do with you as a person. Okay? May give unto you. For with the measure you use, it will be measured unto you. Giving is not merely monetary, but it does not exempt monetary. Because part of giving is giving what you gave. What did you give when you... How, many, how much of you went to work when you did go to work? How much of you? Is it just a part of you? Just your body and not your mind? <laughs> that would be a problem, right? Although it appears that way sometimes. <laughs> Where are you at? <laughs> Where did you go? Okay. You know you go spirit, soul, and body. Your whole life goes. So when you give anything, you are giving of your life. You're giving of your life. One of the greatest gifts you can give. Yeah, think about it. In the husband and wife or male and female relationship, the greatest gift that can be given, and it's viewed more so that way from a, from a female side rather than the male side, that is more re received as the female being the gift over the male. And I know that we're gifts. You know, men, are we gifts? Yes. But in our minds, we like the female gift. It's viewed more so from that, uh, that affectionate side. That our wives are gifts to us. And you females, if you take the value of who you are in the Lord and who you are in Christ, then you respect who you are and be a gift to whoever you allow to receive you as a gift. This is why personal development is important. Because if we're going to be giving, we must develop ourselves. I, I cannot be enhanced or enhance your life without me being enhanced. Now, I don't sit in my room thinking, in my personal study room, thinking, how can I speak to you better? I don't think that. I think, how can I be better? How can I better myself? And you guys receive the residual. I'm not telling you the bad end of it, <laughs> or the latter part of it. I'm saying you receive what I invest into myself. Personal development is meant for who? That's why you pay the price in the mornings or in the evenings or, you know, whenever you feel tired or whatever and you, you know, you got to pay, you're going to sacrifice, you got to do, you know, fight, sleep and being wearied mentally. All the stuff that comes along with your responsibilities as a, as a husband, as a wife, as a father, as a mother, as a son, as a daughter and on and on. You're willing to sacrifice. You're willing to pay the price. So you invest in yourself. It, it requires, in order to invest in yourself, requires discipline to do, so, to do so. And if we're not setting disciplines for our lives, then we're obviously not going to enhance ourselves. Thus we become selfish, and we live in fear, and we negatively impact society. So we don't, we're not going to do that, right? Nope. Amen. Okay. <laughs> Remember, God so loved the world, what did He do? He gave. he gave. Personal development is about giving. 
The more you enhance yourself, the greater the gift you'll be. Verse 18 says this, What makes us known to the world? Here, you remember this, because the word has an impact on you. But here's the thing. Have you ever heard of that expression, my truth? Okay. It's a justification for not wanting to do what God says. That's basically what it is. I, I don't, I'm not going to do what, you know, because even if I read the Bible, that's your interpretation. No, no, no. Read what it says. Across the board, from, my, from what I understand in all parts of the world, adultery is adultery. And the word says it. I shall not commit adultery. Adultery is adultery. What is adultery? Adultery is adultery. There is no my truth to the adultery. Right? Fornication on up the ladder, right? So, we have to have the understanding of what truth really is. We have to know what, what Jesus said, John 14, 6, he says, I am what? The way, the truth, and the life. Now, what does that do? Oh, it is, now you're excluding everyone. No, we're not. You're excluding what Jesus has said. So call it as it is. So you want to justify it, that's fine. You can do whatever you want. God allows you that. He gives you a free will. To choose what you want to do. But it does not mean that it is right. So if you want to be a dog, you can be a dog. Yes. Act like one. You want to change. You want to change everything. Change it. Cut it off. Sew it up. Whatever. Do whatever you want to do, but it doesn't change what God made you to be. Right. What makes us known to the world? How we positively impact the lives of others. That's how we're known. If you think about all the movies and, and the sports arenas, uh, the doctors, uh, lawyers, dentists, uh, people in governmental officials, uh, government positions, all these people that are in leadership that you see, pastors and so forth. What makes the difference? What's the difference? Is it the position? Because a lot of positions, people in position, that are raunchy, wretched, ratchet, ratchet, <laughs> wretched and ratchet, <laughs> they're just not right. So just because position is there doesn't mean this automatically you're at that place. There is a personal development that must take place and a commitment that needs to be in place in order for it to have an impact on, on people's lives. So we receive a responsibility for what we do every day and it's up to us if we want to positively impact the world. Amen. What brings us forth is what the scripture says. And I don't want to go back to it. That's why uh, you guys with me. The scripture says, he, what, what brings us forth? He says, brings forth truth brings forth. Say that with me. Truth brings forth. Say it again. One more time. Truth has to be qualified. And we've got to know what truth is all about. In all the different departments, in all the different areas of life, in all the positions in the world today, truth is the issue. How truthful are you? How integral are you? And you can, because you're listening to political people and you're listening to what they're saying and you're judging it. We are judging it. And we're saying, that's a lie. Or that is truth. Jesus is truth. What it, uh, the, I forgot the, the guy's name that questioned Jesus and he said, I, have to, I wash my hands clean of this. I find no fault in him. Was it Herod? I don't know. I don't, someone was in a political leadership. And he, and he was the one that was determining whether he was going to go to be crucified, right? As a criminal. To judge him as a criminal. He said, I wash my hands clean of this. I find no fault in him. And I mean, if we look in the mirror, we can find fault. 
us. But there was no fault in Jesus. And he spoke truth. Jesus was full of what? Grace and truth. Because he loved people. He loved people. To the death. So remember, truth is to move you forward. Not backward. Okay? The word of truth is what we need. We need truth. And are you, are, you know, when, something, when somebody lies to you, do you like it? Do you like it? Do you like when someone lies to you? No. Isn't it disappointing? Yeah. It's discouraging, right? It because you're, most of the time you're being lied to by someone who you trust, believe. And so when they do, what happens? Yeah, disappointment. The greater the expectation, the greater the disappointment. Here it says that the Word of God is alive and is powerful, active, sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and, of, and able to judge the thoughts and intents of the heart. It's what we left off last week. God's Word is able to judge the motives of the heart. And this is where, you, uh, matter, as a matter of fact, um, Let's go there because most of the time people fall back on this. Even sinners fall back on this. Judge not. Judge not. You can't judge me. Judge not. Can we, can we look at the verse? This is Matthew chapter 7. Uh, let me get it bigger. Can you see it? Matthew chapter 7. And... All through our lives, we will be judging things. We will be judging. Here's what they're not saying. We are not sending people to hell, even though we would like to. You need at least stay in there for a good 50 years. We have eternity, so at least you fill it for 50 years before you experience the peace of God and the joy and the rest and all that because of all the hell you put me through. So I just want you just to be touched to just a little bit. Well, that's, that's not the proper way of thinking. But that's not the kind of judgment that Jesus is talking about. Because throughout our whole lives, we are judging. Every single day, we are judging. And to say otherwise, you're lying. I judge you on that. <laughs> I just judge you. <laughs> okay, look, but let's, let's see the context of where this idea comes from about don't judge me. You can't judge me. You're stupid. <laughs> All right, verse number one. Judge not that you be not judged. There you go. Right there, we stop. That's the whole, that's the whole chapter. That is the verse. That is the book. Close it, shut it. That's what it is. Judge not that you be not So, that Scripture says it. Don't judge. That's my truth. That's what it says. Right? But let's read on. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. True, because what? You know that. If somebody calls you out on something, what are they going to do? Uh, what about you? <laughs> Can I use the example of the vegetables? Remember? With Rory? When you're telling Rory to eat it? Can I use it? <laughs> Can I use that? Can I use it? Okay, all right. So, <laughs> my son-in-law. Gotta love him. Gotta love him. <laughs> he's on. He's on Rory. Telling Rory, you need, mate, you need, he's supporting the family. You know, hey, you gotta eat your vegetables. You gotta eat your vegetables. Oh, and then I look over in his bowl, and I'm in the between, in the middle of him. I look, and I see, put to the side. <laughs> I said, uh, what about your vegetables? <laughs> he says, he gets it. He says, see, Rory, I'm going to eat my. <laughs> For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. <laughs> well, see, that's, and that's what it's in reference to, like these types of things that we can see. Jesus said, you, Matthew 7, Jesus said, you will know them by their what? 
I can't hear you. Once again. Fru what are what are fruits? What are fruits? Are you fruity? No. <laughs> no. Fruits are evidences. You're on the tree, in the tree, you plant the seed, and then yeah. the stump, and then the branches, then the leaves, and what comes out? The fruit, whatever fruit, it is. Whatever fruit it, is. it is. The fruit. If it's a fruit tree, right? And that's how you can judge what kind of tree it is. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You can discern that. You can see that. It is what it is. Do you know an e when there's evil present? Hello? Do you know when evil is present? Yes, we do. Mm hmm You ever smell something yeah. that is not good? That's called what? Judgment. Yeah. That's true. You ever smell something that's good? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's good judgment, right? He says, and with the measure you use, it will be measured again for you. Verse number three. And why do you see the what? In the same context of judging. Same book, same chapter, forget the chapter and forget the, the number. It wasn't written that way. It was a letter. Right? Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not consider the log that is in yours, in your own eye? Or how will you say to your brother, let me pull the speck out of your eye when a log is in your own eye? It doesn't make sense. Literally, if we took that metaphor and I have a log in my eye and I'm saying, hold on one second, there's a speck in yours. Let me take it out. And I have the tweezers. Click! <laughs> I'm going to take your eyeball out. <laughs> but you, you understand? This is what Jesus is talking about. Let me first get my life cleared up before I can speak into your life. He said, you're a hypocrite. Yeah. I didn't say this. Jesus said, you hypocrite. First, first. What did he say? First. First what? Take the log, Take the log out of your own eye. And then you can judge. Then you can see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. This is what he's talking about. Once again, he's not talking about sending you to heaven or hell. You don't have, we don't have that authority. He's talking about here on earth and what we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor throw your pearls before swine. That's judgment. Your gift, your value. You know not everyone is going... There, how many, do we have haters in our day? Do we have jealous people? Yep. Envious people? Are they in our day? Are they in the church? Yep. So that's there. It's present. So do you use judgment? Do you have to discern in the church? <laughs> yes, you do. Yes, you do. He says, do not give <laughs> Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor throw your pearls before the swine, lest they trample under them and, and their feet under their feet and turn around and attack you. See, see, you see the, the idea with this? What we're talking now, you think about it. If you're gonna be checking someone on something. They're going to, if you are not right, they're going to attack you like a dog. Yes. Who in the, what do you, who do you think you are? Right? You think you're better than me? Isn't that the phrase? So that's what that's in, that's in, that's what that is in reference to when it talks about judgment. Here's the thing. We have truth as a basis to our life. And how should we operate with that truth? So I'm going to be rebuking you, getting on your case, telling you what's right and what's wrong. That's, that's how I operate, right? Is that how you do it? No, you don't. Jesus operated with what? Grace and truth. Grace and truth. You can gracefully speak truth. When do you know 
Do you, is there a right time, use your judgment, to speak truth to people? Yes, there is. The time and the season. There's some times that, like, you know, you ever heard of the monkey story, cutting off the monkey tail? You don't cut off the spider monkey, that story, that illustration of the monkey jumping all over the place, and then the guy's in his room, and he's ha hacking away at his tail one inch at a time, thinking it won't hurt as much. Sometimes it takes a hack, one hack. But you got to use your judgment on that. Yeah. You got to use your, your your discernment. Is it a right time? Is every time a right time? No. There's times. You know, think about this. Y'all, we all are. There's a guy got grown people in here. <laughs> the baby's, she's exempt. How do you speak to grown people? Grown people, they have their own minds, their own thinking. It requires judgment. It requires truth. And it re requires grace and love. Amen? Amen. Well, I'm going to stop here. I trust this has been beneficial to you. And as you continue to hear this message, please be encouraged. No, God wants us to be the best gift that we can be. Every good and perfect gift comes from, from above. God intended for you to be here. Yes. God intended for us to be here. Yes. And he intended for us to be a gift. Yes. And we're a blessing going somewhere to be a blessing. Yes. Amen. So thank you for taking the time to do so. Please subscribe. Press the notifications. And like. And thank you for tuning in. If, if you're going to be giving to our ministry, you give to through Venmo and you're giving to Faithwired. And we will see you next time.